Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timperley. It's great to uh, be here today with uh, Erin Zimmerman from Trace Analytics. Hi, Erin. First time with us. You're looking forward to it? Is you... Oh, it, your mic's not on, I don't think, Erin. <laughs> Still not, still can't hear you, or is, oh dear. Right, can, um, could you just close close the webinar and come back in again and, and see if that works, yeah. Uh, you can hear me, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, let me know that you can hear me. Um, all the testing that we do beforehand, everything is spot on, and then you click that go live button and it all goes pear-shaped. Anyway, today's subject is gonna be critical control points using compressed air testing to monitor risk. And as mentioned, that's with Erin Zimmerman, and Erin uh, is from Trace Analytics. And uh, Trace Analytics are one of the Food Safety Friday sponsors. So what I'll do is, I'll play the sponsor ads um, while Erin gets online and then we'll say hello to her when, when she joins us, okay? Be back in a couple of minutes. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Okay, we're back. Uh, that's the messages from the Food Safety Friday sponsors. And one Hi. of those sponsors. Can you hear is, me now? Yes, is Trace Analytics. And Hi. from Trace Analytics, here's Erin Zimmerman. Uh, <laughs> hey, you know, trust me and my big mouth saying that, you know, <laughs> things don't. Anyway, the most important thing is you're here in time for the presentation. Just tell us, uh, before we do get on with the presentation, Erin, where, where are you joining us from today? I'm coming all the way from Austin, Texas. Lovely. And I'm uh, in Manchester in the UK, where it's very hot at the moment. And um, right, we're ready for the presentation. I'll be back for the Q&A 
later. If you want to hold your questions till the end, that would be great. Uh, but for now, I'll hand you over to Erin. Uh, and there we go. Thank you, Simon. Great. Well, thank you, everyone who signed in and joined us today. I'm very excited to get started. Um, our presentation today is about critical control points um, and how we can help you identify those within your facilities um, so you are better equipped to monitor your risks. Um, and, you know, the most important thing is food safety. So monitoring is what it's all about. I'm sure most of you are familiar with HACCP or, you know, hazard analysis for critical control points. Uh, so that's going to be our focus today. And um, here's a little bit about me. Again, uh, Simon introduced me. I work at Trace Analytics. I'm the customer service and sales manager. Um, our goal at Trace Analytics um, and my focus is to provide all of our customers with the best customer service experience possible. Um, we have two dedicated teams that are happy and willing to answer any questions you may have, um, you know, any bumps you may come across while sampling, troubleshooting, and just knowledge in general. And here's a little bit about what we'll be discussing, our presentation overview. So I already mentioned defining critical control points. Um, and that's really about identifying and eliminating risks to your food products um, and the sources that those contaminants can be um, introduced into your systems and how to monitor and manage the risks that you are probably familiar with and come across every day. So here are the, a little bit more about uh, ha the HACCP application. Here are the seven, um, the seven principles of HACCP which you have hazard analysis, critical control points, prevention measure, measures, and then after that you have prevention monitoring procedures, establishing your action plan, verifying those controls that you've set into place, and then keeping logs of everything. Number seven is especially important uh, when it comes to time for your audits and you know they're always going to be checking that you do have everything documented all your boxes are checked so you know, if you if you don't keep your logs then all of the hard work that you've done throughout the year um, you'll have nothing to show for it Okay, so characteristics of a compressed air system. Um, we realize that, you know, compressed air testing is our whole world. It's what we do day in and day out, but we also recognize that it's a very small portion of everything that you monitor in your facilities and in the production of your products. Um, this is where having a HACCP plan is critical um, because compressed air systems are dynamic and they're going to be changing throughout the year. Um, you know, changes in, in production is going to affect that, weather changes is going to affect that, the age of your system is going to affect that. So it, it's something that really needs to be monitored um, continuously. All right, and the contaminants that ISO 8573 looks for is particulate, water, oil, and micro. And we'll get into each of these in more detail coming up. Okay. 
one of the questions we get asked all the time is how are these you know contaminants introduced into my system um, identifying the source of the contamination is extremely important um, when it comes down to troubleshooting um, things to look for would be um, your filters there you know there could be coalescing filters uh, charcoal filters, your dryers could be sources of contamination, um, your sampling points, and um, even like the hoses and valves and fittings that you use. There could also be leaks. Um, so my staff and I are very knowledgeable when it comes to helping you to troubleshoot and identify um, the sources of your contaminations. And we have uh, sampling equipment and tests that can help you along with that. All right, and just to get a little bit more in depth, um, one of the biggest sources of contamination is particles. Um, particles can be a huge problem and they're often really hard to get rid of. Um, I, I would say black iron piping is one of the worst offenders when it comes to shedding particles. It may not be feasible. Um, you know, black iron was used in a lot of older facilities um, that are obviously still in production. And it's, it's not always feasible to be able to remove them and replace them. Um, but knowing what kind of piping you have um, is vital to knowing what kind of um, precautions that you need to take to be able to combat that. Um, so what kind of filters you can have at your endpoints of use um, that are going to help you remove those contaminants, um, you know, rust, dust, everything that that lives in there uh, from from eventually reaching your your food product. Um, one, one story that always comes to mind is we had a, a customer who, you know, they, they were actually using the wrong kind of filter. Um, they were having particle issues after, you know, multiple tests. They were extremely frustrated. And what it really came down to was they were using a filter that wasn't even for made for the food industry. Um, and so once they found that out, you know, obviously that was the problem and they were able to get that replaced and, and, and move on. Um, so knowing what is going on in your system is extremely important when you're troubleshooting. Um, rubber hoses and types of fitting can also be major contributors to particles um, because they're, uh, permeable and susceptible to leaks. So the ambient air around us is actually going to be absorbed through those through those tubes, um, the hoses, excuse me. Um, and that's actually going to cause them to age faster, which is going to make them, de you know, start to degrade and those can contribute to particles. Uh, we always recommend stainless steel whenever you can use it, um, whether it's, you know, in your piping, in your seals, your valves. Um, it's really the best um, to avoid shedding. Our second source is water. Um, we measure water in parts per million. But knowing what kind of dryers is important here to monitor your system. Um, I have another example of a customer who was trying to reach a ISO purity class one uh, before doing their research and they weren't able to meet it. Um, they were again frustrated because their audit were coming up, was coming up. They were stressed out. Um, and after a little bit of troubleshooting, we determined that the kinds of dryers they were using at their points of use were refrigerated. Um, and it's extremely hard to 
reach any kind of class higher than a class, usually about a class three for a refrigerated dryer. So that comes back to their system's capabilities and what they're actually able to meet. Um, water is not just an isolated issue on its own um, because it can lead to corrosion and rust, and it can also lead to a breeding ground for micro for microorganisms um, if it's pooling within your system. It can be introduced through leaks, um, ineffective filtration, and you know even the orientation of your sampling ports. All right, so oils broke actually broken down into two parts, um, and this is based off of what ISO 8573 re requires. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is oil aerosol. Um, oil aerosol is, or you know, you may have heard of it as oiled mist before. Um, this can be a problem um, due to materials used, um, poor placement of filtration, and you know it's nobody wants oil in their food so making sure that you have um, proper filtration at your points of use is is vital. Um, it can also be introduced from lubricants and cleaning agents so it's really all around you. Um, so identifying the source is important, but also making sure some of those sources you can't get around, right? Like for lubricants, for example. Um, but having the best filtration for your system is is vital for understanding how to control that. The second part of oil is oil vapor. Oil vapor or volatile hydrocarbons exist to some extent as a vapor at normal temperatures and pressures. It can be introduced to your product by, an, again, ineffective filtration from your intake, like exhaust, fuels, solvents, chemicals that you may be used um, in other parts of your facility, and again, cleaning agents and lubricants. So ISO 8573 purity classes one and two include both oil aerosol and oil vapor analysis, which is called total oil. This Now this is something special about trace analytics because we offer that, um, that combination for you. Um, so you can have that on your final reports and show your auditors. Okay, now to the fun stuff. Um, so this is probably my favorite uh, contaminant to talk about, um, but it definitely can pose the most risk to your facility, your product, and eventually your end user. This is where having a HACCP plan in place at your facility is extremely important because one of the major contributing factors is cross-contamination. Microorganisms like bacteria, yeast, and mold can all have a negative impact in your food quality. And bacteria like Listeria, Salmonella, and E. coli are particularly dangerous for, consumer, for consumers and is something that should be monitored for regularly. Um, these kinds of microbes can be introduced in a number of different ways. Um, again, through your intake, it can leak from leaks with it throughout the system, um, or they can even grow in pooling water or oil um, that may be present. So you can kind of see how everything is tied together. Um, you know, you you have to monitor for all four, and there's a reason for that. Okay, so moving on to standards and regulators. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar um, with the standards and regulators, but you may not always be familiar with exactly what 
they're asking of us, what they're requiring. Um, so I wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, here, right here we have the ISO 8573 purity class chart. Um, this is, I'm, I know all of you are familiar with this. Um, it's, it's an international standard. Um, it's a common language. It's used in the, that's used in the industry. Um, it's known by your auditors. It's known by you guys, the manufacturers. It's, it's known by compressor, filter, and dryer retailers. Um, so really getting a good grasp on how to read this chart is super important because um, because the retailers you know are going to be using this to communicate what their dryers or filters are capable of doing for you um, so knowing what limits you're trying to meet based off of your um, your application and where your compressed air comes into contact with your product um, is going to translate into what kinds of, of procedures um, you should be looking for. All right, so SQF edition 8.1. I felt like it was really important to show all of you exactly what it says um, and what it states. Um, it, one of the things we get uh, questions about is that it seems a little vague. It's like it's telling me, but it's not telling me. Um, and so what I wanted to point out was the shell, um, where it says, you know, compressed air and other gases that come into contact with food or food surfaces shall be clean and present no rest risk to food safety. That is a key word and it's telling you that this is something you must do. You must monitor for, for these contaminants if you're trying to meet SQF standards. And here is what SQF edition 8.1 says about micro. So again, I'm going to point out the shell compressed air systems and systems used to store or dispense other gases used in the manufacturing process shall be maintained regularly monitored for quality and microbial purity. All right, and here we have the BRC or the British Retail Consortium. This is what it states in its most recent edition for compressed air um, and monitoring it. And again, you'll see that, that shell that I keep stressing. So if you're following the, BL, the BRC, um, you know, we just felt like it was really important for you guys to know what those standards are actually telling us. Um, I think the BRC is great because it's the only standard that gives exact ISO 8573 purity class designations um, for indirect and indirect contact. Um, so I know, you know, we we have a lot of uh, food manufacturers from here in the states um, that you know may not follow the BRC, um, but we we bring it up to our customers all of the time and use it as a really great tool um, because it it prov it's, provides a really great guideline for you know what you should be testing whether your product comes in direct or indirect contact. I'm sorry, your compressed air comes in direct or indirect contact with your product. All right, so what about monitoring plans? Monitoring plans for ISO 8573, um, it can seem a little bit overwhelming. Um, we you know, we try and help our customers out as best as possible. So we've broken it down into these four steps. Um, 
and we recognize that you know a lot of times because compressed air is only one part that many food manufacturers don't even start monitoring for it until they've um, had an audit deficiency um, so you know our goal is just to make things as easy as possible for you okay uh, one of the ways that we've been able to do that is we've come up with a risk assessment plan. Um, this is one of my favorite tools that we have. Um, it's super helpful, um, especially for first time customers. Um, conducting a risk assessment just helps you actually, you know, go through your facility, ask yourselves those questions like, does your compressed air come in direct or indirect contact with your product? What kinds of dryers do I have? Is my product readily consumed or does it need to be washed and cooked first? Um, what is the potential ha um, harm, you know, if we don't monitor what could that what could that look like for our consumers and and our facility? Um, you know, the the biggest concern would be you know having you know ha having to slow down production time or even a recall um another question that you know it it gets you to ask yourself is what controls do we already have in place um and are they enough do those controls need to be do more controls need to be implemented? Um, you know, do we need to change things around? Do we need to do it more frequently? Um, and again, this is because compressed air systems are incredibly dynamic um, and they're subject to change. So keeping keeping up with this is is it is a big task, but you know, we just want to make it easy for you guys. All right, so um, assessing your risk. This is super important and it's our first step. Um, you need to be able to, after doing your risk assessment, um, you know, find out your system capabilities and do we maybe need to get new dryers or filters, um, what does our facility and our product really need? All right, so here we have uh, just some examples for you guys of ISO 8573 levels of risk. Um, so, you know, depending on what you find after conducting your own risk assessment, you may determine that you're high risk. Um, this would be, you know, if your compressed air is coming in direct contact. Um, medium risk, maybe if it's if it's not coming in direct contact. And this may vary through throughout your facility, um, you know, depending on if it's a um, direct point of use or just varying stages within the production. Um, so not everyone is going to be high risk. You know, if um, if maybe you're making um, packaging, you might consider yourself low, low risk, um, but you're not going to know until you perform a risk assessment. And this is really where HACCP comes into play and in identifying those critical control points. Okay, so I felt like this was worth going over because it's hands down um, one of the, the most common questions we get. Um, we've come up with a couple different plans. Um, if you're doing a percentage, we would recommend that you test at least 20% of all of your sampling points throughout your facility. Um, this could be after filters, after dryers, or at the compressor itself. Um, we would always recommend doing um, 
taking tests before and after any scheduled maintenance. Um, this is important because it's going to show the the lifetime of the filters. It's going to show you the changes that have taken place. Um, this information is important to see if you need to change your monitoring plan. Um, and then of course afterwards to determine if what you've just done, what you've just installed, um, is doing what was intended or if there's any, you know, potential issues there. You know, um, anytime you do maintenance there, you're going to be causing um, particles um, just from, you know, moving things around, you know, whether it's piping or filters, you know, so making sure that everything is clean after all the hard work you just did is really important. Um, a minimum plan would be at the compressor, at your end point of use, and then somewhere in the middle. Um, this plan is especially helpful when you're trying to identify uh, where contamination, where contaminants may have been introduced into your system. You know, you can kind of start from the outside and work your way in to see, you know, where the, the problem area is. Um, and then finally, we have the single. Um, the single is going to help you pass your audit um, and it's going to check the box to show that you've monitored, um, but it's not really going to give you a whole lot of information um, if your test results were to come back with a potential issue. You know, if you're only testing at your end point of use and say your results came back with um, higher particles than you were expecting. You really have no idea where to start um, because you have the entire system to um, to go from. All right, another frequent question we get is how often do we test? Um, so the key takeaway here is a dynamic system is going to change throughout the year. So the more data you have, the better you are going to be able to monitor um, everything properly and ensure the safety of your product. Um, again, annually is kind of like the single. It's going to help you. Um, it's going to help you pass your audit. It's going to check that box for you. Um, but it's not, it's not really giving you it, the full picture. It's not telling you what's going on throughout the entire year. Um, and, you know, it, you could be in for a shock the next time you test um, because you've had an entire year of, of a dynamic system changing and you, you're not really going to know when or where that those changes took place. Uh, Semi-annually is obviously better, gives you a little bit more information, um, but we would always recommend at least quarterly testing for to our customers. Um, and this is again just because, you know, weather changes throughout the year can play have an impact on your system. Uh, colder temperatures may mean bay doors are shut, furnaces are running, um, and then you know summer months. A lot of in a lot of places that brings. Um, warmer weather and humidity. Um, so it's, you, it's, it's just more information that you're going to have in your in your tool belt. All right, so a laser particle counter is one of the ways that we can um, we can measure particles at Trace Analytics. Um, a part of any HACCP plan is monitoring the critical control points and ensuring that they are in fact effective. Um, the laser particle counter or LPC for short is great um, because you can read your results directly from the system or from the instrument, excuse me. Um, they're accurate and can read all the way down to 0 0.1 microns, which is the smallest size range um, dictated in the ISO 8573 purity class chart. Um, but they're not for everybody. Um, yes, the sampling times are really short, which off the bat sounds great, um, but it 
it may not be representative of what's going on in your system day in and day out. Um, I like to I like to think about it as you, the readings that you get from these instruments are kind of like a snapshot in time. Um, it's, it's what's going on that moment. Um, and often we end up recommending them to our customers um, to do on-site troubleshooting. Um, because they're great, you get those you get those on-site readings fast, and you can you can do tests to kind of narrow down where an issue may be coming up. Uh, the other way we measure particles is um, by microscopy. Um, this is where our lab technicians actually count the membranes or count the particles on the filter membranes. Um, it's great because it's inexpensive. It's better. It's a little bit better um, because it's a it's more representative of the of a dynamic system because the samples are taken over a longer period of time. Um, but it cannot detect down to uh, that 0 0.1 um, particle size. Um, the, the lowest it can read is 0 0.5, and that's due to diffraction effects, um, which is a fancy way to say because those particles are so large, because there's a chance you could have large particles, we may not be able to see what's behind them. Okay, and water, we use um, detector tubes. These these tubes are great because they're inexpensive, they're relatively fast, um, and you can even do a little bit of on-site troubleshooting with these as well. Um, some customers have issues with them. They're a little bit less accurate than um, electronical um, dew point reader, and glass, unfortunately, you know, it's it's not it's not appropriate for um, all all manufacturing plants, especially bottling. All right, back to oil. Uh, this is a filter cassette. This is how we um, measure oil aerosol. Um, it's a it's a membrane extraction. Um, it's great because it's inexpensive. Um, and representative of your compressed air system because again the samples are taken over a longer period of time and our what our lab does is they actually weigh the the membrane after you send it back to determine the amount of of oil of oil that was collected okay and for oil vapor we use charcoal tubes um, the charcoal, the charcoal in these tubes is, um, captures the compounds and we're able to actually characterize them for you, identifying any underlying and potential issues in your system. Charcoal tubes are great because they're inexpensive and accurate and although sampling times are a little bit longer for the more stricter um, ISO purity classes, it is more representative of your compressed air system. And ISO 8573 requires that both oil, aerosol, and oil vapor for classes one and two. Again, this is what we call total oil because it combines those two results on your report. Uh, this is actually unique to Trace Analytics. All right, and this is how we um, test for microbial. Uh, we use an impaction sampler with agar plates to take samples. Um, the samples are then validated for growth of bacteria, yeast, and mold. Uh, we can perform total plate counts and gram staining, and we can even do further analysis um, for, for um, microbes that would be harmful for human consumption. Um, our lab director, Maria Sandoval, is actually on the ISO 8573 committee, which is awesome. Um, 
they focus on parts one through nine and are working to make sure the newest methods and tech are implemented for facilities following the standard. All right, so now that we've talked about why you should test and what you should be looking for, here's what we, here's uh, the packages that we can offer you. Um, again, these are based off of your risk um, that, you know, hopefully you will determine after identifying those critical control points using your HACCP plans and principles um, and then, you know, doing doing a risk assessment for yourself. So we have our, we have our basic, which is the shortest um, sampling time and also quick turnaround time. Um, it's great for low risk or if you're in a time crunch um, and it, it's going to check your box, check that box for your audit. Um, a value is going to cover kind of the mid range um, as far as the purity ISO 8573 purity classes. Um, so there would be, this would be for, you know, your indirect, um, your medium to low risk um, applications. And then our pro is um, what we recommend for high risk customers. Um, th these would be, you know, direct contact um, and people who are, have determined that they need to be meeting those, those strict purity classes. Uh, we also have a diagnostic um, package. It's not mentioned here, um, but it's great for first timers because it doesn't force you to choose purity classes um, ahead of time. It just kind of shows you exactly where you fall within the ISO purity class chart. Um, so again, it's, it's great for people who are just starting out on this journey. And these are the packages that we offer for um, testing micro. Uh, we have our basic package, um, which is a short sampling time. Uh, the, the turnaround time for our micro packages is 14, 14 days um, and your, the basic package is going to offer total plate count. Um, so we, after the incubation period, we simply tell you how many colonies may be present in your sample. Um, this is going to help you again pass your audit. It's going to show that you are monitoring, but it's not going to tell you what those um, microbes are. Whereas the pro, um, it's also going to give you a total plate count, um, but it's also going to give you bacterial classification. Um, so for the pro package, we do gram staining for all the all of the colonies that may be present in your sample um, and gram staining is the first step in identifying the organisms um, and then if you do have organisms I, in your samples you can always upgrade to do uh, further analysis with chromogenic identification um, this is where we can tell you if things like e coli salmonella and listeria are are present or either not present, and that's called uh, presumptive identification. Okay, well, thank you everyone so much who logged in today. Um, that was my presentation, and I I hope um, you were able to take something away uh, today. I'm available. My information is down at the bottom of the slide. Um, you can email or call me and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have and I hope you stick around. We're going to do a little Q&A um, session right now. <clears throat> okay, thanks very much for that Erin. Um, let me just uh, move your slides and then get into the Q&A. Right. So can you see the sidebar there? So first question from Vinod, uh, whether preventive maintenance plays a vital role in preventing contamination. So basically, yeah. does preventive maintenance play a vital role in preventing food contamination? Yes. So um, why I mentioned that during the presentation was um, because, oh, okay. 
sorry, I see the question now. Thank you. Um, so prevention maintenance um, definitely plays a huge role in preventing contamination for your food. Um, you know, it, it all has to do with identifying um, are the procedures that you have in place effective or not effective? Um, and that could be um, identifying your critical control points throughout your facility, but also the procedures and precautions that you've taken um, after identification. Um, so that could be your filters or your dryers, making sure that they're actually up to speed with what you're trying to reach. Yeah. Okay, um, and Christina, uh, is it mandatory to use food grade lubricants in a compressor? Um, so food grade lubricants are great. Um, we would recommend them, but it really does come down to um, where the lubricants are being used and what kind of filtration you have between that and the endpoints of use where the compressed air is coming in contact, um, whether in direct, direct or indirect with your product. Um, and one of the ways you can test or you can know is, um, is if you test for it. You know, once you get your total oil results back and you can see, are these, are these lubricants getting through? If they are, at what levels? Um, and does this present a risk? Yeah, okay, thank you. And uh, another one from Vinod. What types of filters can be used in our compressor to avoid foreign particle contamination? Okay, well, that's a good one. Um, and one that unfortunately I can't answer right off the top of my head. Um, I, mean, I can I, definitely get yeah. back to you on that. Yeah, any questions that uh, uh, we're unable to answer, what we'll do, yeah, we, we are, or if we can't answer any or we don't have time to do them all, we'll make sure we get those answered uh, later. Yeah, I would um, just, I would hate to recommend, um, you know, the type of filter, not knowing more information about um, yeah. his use. And also Sharon's asked a similar question about uh, type of filter, Okay. Um, to trap moisture again, is that same? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to take a little bit of time and, and do a little bit of research on my own. Um, okay. But we'll definitely get back to all of you. Okay. Interesting question from Marvi. What's the difference in the analysis of food grade air and scuba diving compressed air? Okay. Um, so they use different standards, they use different specifications. Um, the food grade air um, that's used in manufacturing. So it's it's coming into contact with, with the food, um, you know, throughout the entire production line. Um, so the goal there is to ensure that nothing is going to be contaminated or cause risk for you know, for the end user, for the consumer. Um, whereas scuba, di you know, scuba diving or breathing air, which is also something that we we do at Trace Analytics, um, you know, those standards and specifications, depending on what you're following, is more about the immediate health of the person breathing it. Um, for scuba specifically, it also takes into account the different pressures um, that the divers may be, may be under. And just... Okay, sorry, go on, what was you going no. to say? To... So okay. That's it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, and our, Aaron's um, asking, how often can one have swab analysis? Uh, is, is, uh, uh, does that make sense to you, that question? Yeah, that yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, we use an impaction sampler at Trace Analytics, um, but we can do swab testing. Uh, we don't provide the swabs for you, um, but what we can do is um, provide you the agar plates that we use, um, and what you would do is, you know, just real quick, swab testing um, is mostly used for surfaces and 
um, things that come in contact with the food to make sure that there's nothing growing on them. So what you would do is use the swab and then introduce that to our agar plates and send those back to us for analysis. Um, so as far as how often, um, you know, I would, I would recommend at least, you know, depending on, you know, what your risk analysis says, at least quarterly. That way, that way you know um, what's going on throughout your facility. Yeah, uh, and Fazana has um, a similar thing. How often do we need to monitor or test compressed air? Do you have? Would you recommend sort of a rolling plan that covers your whole facility throughout the year or something like that? Yes, absolutely. Um, that way, you're you're going to have more information, um, and you know that's just that's just more knowledge for you, and to ensure that you're covering all your bases, you're making sure that you know throughout the entire year, these are the changes that we need to implement. You know, depending on the time of the year, the amount of production that's that's taking place. Yeah. What sort of how how quickly a test is it? Is it hours, days, weeks? How long does it take to to do oh, yeah. a test? Um, so our tests, depending on what package you choose, um, they're going to be anywhere. They could be anywhere from a hundred and twenty to ten minutes. So you know, if you're trying to reach those stricter classes, you do have to um, take the samples for longer. Um, but for the, we do also offer quick turnaround times. Um, so once we receive your samples, it takes us about three to five business days um, to analyze you, your samples and get you your results. But we also offer uh, rush analysis too. Okay, thanks, Erin. And uh, Vinod again, are there any instruments or equipment that you know about that you can check and monitor air quality? Uh, rather than compressed air, just air quality. Oh, for ambient, yes. Um, we actually do offer ambient, some ambient testing. Um, we have what it, we can test um, for microbes in ambient air, and we can also use the laser particle counters um, to test ambient air. Okay. So we, we uh, could help them there. Yeah, and do you do on-site testing, or is everything shipped to you? Do you? So we are the lab only. We don't offer on-site testing for any of our customers, um, but we do some of our customers. What we would consider to be distributors, um, we work very closely with them, and these are the guys that you would want to contact, and they would go to your facility and actually take the samples for you, um, like. Again, we work really closely with these guys. Uh, we have training for them. Um, we're in contact constantly. Um, and we can even provide, um, we can even provide you with a list of uh, distributors in your area. Okay. Um, Anurag said, uh, what does 14 day turnaround mean? The, the term turnaround, do you mean? Oh. Yes, so so that's for um, for testing micro. So that's once we receive your sample in house, it takes us uh, fourteen days to incubate those plates and um, and make a report uh, a detailed report for you. Okay, and Felipe, Felipe how does aluminium pipe for compressed air fare? as a replacement for black iron pipe? Um, so aluminum piping is better than black iron, um, but it's still toward kind of towards the the shedding um, offender side. Uh, we actually do have a little chart that kind of shows um, the best materials to use and all the way to, you know, the worst. Um, if you wanted to reach out, we'd be happy to share. Okay. And uh, rehab, should we uh, make oil residue analysis even if the compressor is free of oil? Yes, absolutely. Um, because we've had many, many customers 
um, you know, test, come to us for testing. Um, and they've had what was sold to them as oil-free compressors come back with both oil vapor and oil aerosol. Um, and so this is really just making sure that everything that was installed, all the procedures, precautions taken are actually working. Okay, and Nancy, um, is trace analytics applicable to N2 generators? Yes, we not only test compressed air, but we also test compressed gases. Well, that's, that's quite a straightforward answer. <laughs> Elizabeth, COVID-19 is changing the way we do business, certainly is. Please update us on procedures for collecting and transporting samples, especially for your international clients. Okay. Um, yes, absolutely it is. Um, and I would, I would direct Elizabeth to our website aircheclab.com. Um, right up at the top, we um, have a banner that if you click on it, it's going to give you um, everything that we're doing um, as far as procedures and precautions um, during during this time. Okay, and Kavi, uh, can the Parker CAM2 compressed air micro microbial test unit work also are you familiar with the cam2 compressed air microbial test a unit? little bit um we don't we don't actually have the cam2 um we we considered we considered getting one um and offering it to our our customers but i don't know the exact reasons why we did not go with it um but I can definitely uh, get back to get back to you on that. Um, I do know that the reason why we use the impaction sampler is because it's required by ISO 8573, um, and it's also a validating method. Okay, and uh, Michael, uh, how can the testing of co compressed air for micro contamination in air? service units be used to improve maintenance so the testing results that come back how can you use that to improve your maintenance well it should be used to improve yeah 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 so i mean you can look at those test results as as telling you you know that's that's your system telling you what's going on inside it um, so your reports are your tools to go back and try and find the sources of those contamination um, or, you know, those contaminants that you're seeing um, and try and make adjustments, you know, going back to the critical control points and, and your HACCP plan, seeing what procedures do we already have in place and are they effective and do we, do we need to reevaluate those and change them up? Um, so, yeah, your reports are your tools. Mm. And I guess as well, you trend those results over time, looking to continually mm -hmm. improve and exactly drive down any contaminants of all types. Um, Vinod again, uh, how can we test the quality of CO2 gas used for carbonated beverages? Yeah, so um, we, we have lots of of customers who who use other gases, um, not just compressed air like CO2. Um, so depending on what you're looking for, um, if you're just looking for contaminants, you know, you could still have particles, water, oil, and microbes growing in your um, CO2 systems. Um, but we also offer um, gas testing um, or um, we use a GCMS machine um, which is gas chromatography. So we can give you um, percentages that are in your gas sample as well. Okay, very good. Um, and some more, uh, got one there. One of our machines does not have a filter. What kind of filters can, oh, another filter question. Um, what we'll do is like, let's like say, all the chat logs we can download the, these and what we normally do we will send them to uh, you Erin yeah. and, and Trace and then you can pick through them and, and then what we're happy to do is uh, we can put answers to those questions that we've missed and we will email 
let's say that briefing sheet with the the questions and answers on back to all the registrants so um, yeah that'd be great that's a good way to do it um okay uh i think that filter one was the last one. Oh, there's another one from okay. Ansari CO2 gas for carbonated beverages or nitrogen gas for packaging. Can, can we consider this a CCP? I don't. Okay, yeah. there it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I would consider that a critical control point uh, because it's where the cart where the CO2 um, gas is being introduced into your product. So you want to make sure that at those points that um, it's it's clean and safe. Yeah. I missed a question earlier about um, the process for micro testing. Did you mention in impaction sampler? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's how, what we how, use. How, yeah. How does it work that? Um, so the impaction sampler um you would connect it to your sampling port um just like you would do with any of our other kits um and it actually um you know with, with the pressurized gas it's going you load the um agar plate in there and it funnels the the gas or compressed air and blows over the plate right Okie dokie. Clear. Right. Um, okay. I mean, some of the questions are off topic, um, so I'm not going to uh, go through those, but Surabi, maybe that is a relevant one. Surabi, in many food products, temperature is considered to be a CCP. How far air compressor can be considered? Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, so temperature is, is a big critical control point, right? Um, you know, depending on the type of product, um, it, you need to maintain those temperatures um, to ensure that, you know, microorganisms are not going to start to grow um, and contaminate the product. The same thing is true with your compressed air system. Um, flu flu fluctuations through um, temperatures throughout the year are going to change the needs um, of the compressed of the compressed air system, um, you know, colder months there may be furnaces running that's going to introduce exhaust and fumes through your intake air. Um, you know, warmer temperatures may increase humidity levels in the ambient air that could cause condensation to grow or to build and pool, um, which could then be breeding grounds for for microorganisms. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you for this informative session. Have a great weekend. That's from Patricia, Patricia and uh, oh. Miguel, Miguel. Thank you, Erin. Best regards from Mexico. Thank you so, to all of you. Yeah, so, yeah, we've run over the hour. That was great. Lots of questions. Very engaging, great presentation. Yeah, so I can't we'll, wait to get back to all of them. Yeah, so we'll follow up with everybody. We'll send the recording, the slides and your contact details and um yeah and then we'll probably send a second email to everybody with the answers might take a week or two but uh we'll do we'll that get to them. so have you enjoyed your first time with us erin i did i did thank you so much simon no you made problem. it easy <laughs> we've enjoyed it it's been great uh so i hope to see you again soon have a nice weekend all right bye guys bye stay safe Okay, that was Erin Zimmerman from Trace Analytics. Um, another great session. Um, enjoyed it. I've loaded your certificate in the sidebar. As I said, we will follow up with the uh, video, the slides, and the certificate um, in an hour or so. And uh, yeah, keep registering for these webinars, keep joining us, and keep. Uh, chatting in the sidebar it's fantastic really enjoy it stay safe everybody happy friday enjoy your weekend and uh, we'll see you on the next one take care bye